Thank you very much, uh, Ganesh. I'll just share my screen. So I'd, I'd like to start by um, thanking Gunesh for that introduction, but also thanking uh, Gunesh and Miraban for arranging this series of talks, which I think have been absolutely wonderful, not only in their content, but also uh, in the way that they have um, created a community for us in a time when um, we're all so isolated. Um, I'd also like to start by, by saying that what I'm gonna be talking about here uh, is based on the work of a large number of people, many of whom are, um, uh, are coming in on this uh, talk today. Uh, and I'm extremely grateful to them and, and all the uh, team at Chattahoyuk for, for the cont contributions they have made. Um, and uh, I hope they will feel, those of them that are present, I hope they will feel able at the end of the talk to correct me where I've gone wrong in terms of uh, uh, making sense of their, their data in my own terms. So I, I, I'm always, I have always been very struck by the sort of wide divergence of opinion about whether there was ranking and hierarchy in the Neolithic of the Middle East. While there seems a general consensus at the moment in favor of uh, egalitarianism, many people argue for um, different degrees of ranking at particular sites or regions or time periods. And perhaps Ian Kite describes the situation best when he suggested in 2002 that the middle PPNB societies put an emphasis on egalitarianism while at the same time permitting some social differentiation. The notion of an egalitarian Neolithic is very influenced of course by evolutionary theories if the Neolithic is egalitarian, then it is just a stage in the increasing complexity of society. And the main focus of interest is not in egalitarianism itself, but in the first appearance of the next stage of ranked societies. I wish instead to see egalitarianism in this talk as an active process. This, is not, this idea is of course not a itself novel. Uh, there is a long and distinguished line of research in anthropological um, studies that see egalitarianism as an active process and of course as usual the main figures are, are French so um, for example Pierre Clastre in 1987 says that being egalitarian is an active choice a rejection of unequal power there is of course power in stateless societies based on various forms of personal influence age gender and so on <clears throat> But this power depends on the goodwill of the group and coercive power is seen as, in Clastra's terms, negativity that is immediately subdued and a mortal risk to the group. This point has already been recognized in the Neolithic of the Middle East. For example, rather than seeing egalitarianism as a descriptive category, Ian Kite describes it as a process to deliberately affect community behavior and social relations by emphasizing shared identity and affinity. And further, he says, all egalitarian systems are a reaction against formalized social differentiation. Finlayson says in another quote, there is evidence that early Neolithic societies in Southwest Asia promoted egalitarian behavior. Chattelhuyuk has also seen differences of opinion about whether it is egalitarian or ranked. Mellart, of course, saw priestly er, er, elites, and Paul Wayson, Wayson saw evidence of ranking, whereas I have argued for an aggressive egalitarianism. And part of this talk is to explain what I mean by that term. A cursory look at Chattelhuyuk immediately excites questions about variability and inequality. This is looking uh, at the northern, the northern area um, of uh, Chattelhuyuk. And you can see that some of these buildings are quite large. This is a really big building, it goes all the way down here. Uh, so large buildings, and then over here, there are these little buildings. Uh, so very clear differences in size, but we have found very little that, or little or nothing really that correlates 
uh, with this size variation. The only clear pattern that we have found seems to relate that seems to relate to inequality uh, is that we find a, a, a correlation between the minimum number of individuals buried in houses versus the elaboration of those houses. And I'll be using at various times in this talk, the elaboration index, which is simply a sum of the number of uh, architectural elaborations in the house uh, from um, uh, reliefs and uh, paintings uh, to pillars and pedestals and platforms and so on. And here you can see that there is a correlation between the minimum number of individuals buried in a house and the uh, elaboration index. And it is these more elaborate buildings uh, at the upper end of this scale, uh, which I have called history houses. But this relationship um, with, uh, between burial and elaboration does not correlate with the size of building or the amount of space given over to storage and production. So in, in these graphs here, you have the elaboration index. This is the amount of the space that is taken over by side room storage. And you see there's no correlation in this particular sample. Uh, and uh, similarly, if we look at the overall internal size, there's no correlation with the elaboration index. You've got a very low R squared there. Nor does this correlate with the number of bins and the size of bins. So here we're looking at the elaboration index and the, uh, the, the area of bins in the house. So it is clear that the more elaborate houses with more burials could not translate their position into the control of production and storage. We see a similar lack of correlation if we look at uh, the number of figurines in houses. And here you have uh, the elaboration index shown by this line from the least to the more elaborate. And you see there's no correlation with this, this other line, which is the number of figurines. Similarly for graves, and here I'm take, using the work of Milena Vasic. Um, <clears throat> This, this graph shows the percentage of individuals with different types of associations and treatments uh, in, in burials in buildings plotted against the elaboration index, indices for those buildings. And again, there is no correlation. The more elaborate buildings do not have richer burials. So we have found this same lack of correlation with a large, with a huge array really of variables, whether we are looking at grand stone, plant and animal bone densities, ceramics, and a whole series of skeletal measures of health and uh, work practices. So one can say then that Chattel, Chattel seems a very egalitarian society, except that there are some buildings that have more elaboration and more burial. So some time ago, Blader During noticed an interesting pattern in relation to these types of more elaborate buildings. And he's looking here mainly at the Mellart data, looking at the lower levels here. Uh, and uh, here he's taking into build certain, each building, each one of these columns is a building, uh, looking at the number of burials in black and numbers of paintings and moldings. And you can see here, for example, you get this sort of low number of burials and then the sort of increase right at the end at level six. And you get these higher numbers in most of these uh, later level six uh, buildings, increasing numbers up to this point. And then the sort of drop down later on, the sort of the change associated with this, a lot of burning that goes along with this level six material here. Uh, and in, and some, sometimes the numbers uh, 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 get high uh, at an earlier point. And we can see this, um, also, uh, in it's another of Blader During's um, diagrams <clears throat> where he's um, just showing it differently, looking at burials. And again, again, you see these sort of numbers increasing in the upper levels, um, but it doesn't, it's not always in the level six that you get the increase. You also get this in level seven here. And we, we have, of course, by going down deeper, managed to uh, get a bit more information 
uh, about these uh, sequences that Blader was looking at. Um, for example, here we have a, a building that goes down, a sequence of buildings that goes down earlier, and we're looking at the number of burials here, and you can see this sort of uh, increase, and then, um, then this uh, period here, level eight, uh, when you have burials, but also uh, this is a, a, an elaborate phase where a pair of leopards um, were, was found. So that you get, you appear to get these cycles happening mainly here, but also at level seven and, and earlier. So it seems as if, at least in the early and middle levels, there is a cycle of aggrandizing in which individual buildings increase the number of burials and the amount of elaboration over time. But then there is a dampening or ending, sometimes associated with burning. So I want to look at this uh, in more detail by looking at our, our data. And so here um, we're looking at a, a sequence of buildings in the north 167 to 52 to 51. And this is going up through time in the different phases of these buildings. And you can see that the internal square meterage in this case uh, increases and then drops off uh, after a, a burn, which happens at this level here. And the, side, the amount of side room storage also increases uh, and then drops off. And the elaboration index increases and then drops off and the minimum number of individuals increases, then drops off. The number of bins doesn't really sort of show much of a pattern. And that sort of fits with our sort of lack of evidence of a relationship between elaboration and burial and the bins. <clears throat> so I want to look at this in, as I said, in more uh, detail, sh show you this. We're looking at this building here, which is building 52 mainly, but, and a building below and above it. And this is the sequence of occupation. Um, so here, and I'm very grateful to Boju Tung and Marit Baranski for their help in putting this together. Uh, this is building 167, a sort of smallish building, which uh, in the next phase is basically here. And then you see that the walls have been knocked, knocked down to create two platforms uh, over here. Uh, and some uh, storage and um, ovens and production area. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, and then um, that continues on here and then we move on and then there is further expansion or aggrandizement by uh, taking over more area here. So we've gone from this, we've knocked out and gone through and taken over another building lot if you like next door, we've expanded, gone out even farther west. And as this goes through time, you also see much more elaboration with the bull's horns here. And then there's a burn in this phase. And then we end up with a small building just nestled in here after the burn, building 51. So this is that first uh, building 167, uh, that the side walls are knocked, knocked through. Uh, and then you get these, um, platforms with a um, bench uh, that uh, is built uh, to the west. Um, and uh, so that's this platform here. And then storage and uh, um, ovens and things over here. And then further expansion over here to the, to the, to the west. So the, there's expansion or aggrandizement in terms of size but we also see it in terms of uh, internal elaboration. So here you have a bench, an early bench, which then is used as a, a very simple sort of, sort of bench-like thing, which has wild goat and sheep horns along it. So it becomes more elaborate. But then in the, in the final phase, just before the burn, uh, that is uh, replaced with this massive bench with these huge bull horns uh, along it and an adjacent bucranium uh, above which are placed 13 uh, bull, horn, bull horns. <clears throat> and then after the burn, you get back to building 51, a small, very simple uh, building. So there are several um, 
examples like this. But what I want to emphasize is that this, this, this sequence does not seem to be a matter of conspicuous consumption leading to increased status, but it's a matter of aggrandizing in certain spheres of life, in this case, the space and the benches, which is then dampened in ritual practices, including deposition, uh, discard and burning. There are several examples uh, of this. Another example is building uh, 77, which ends up with this very elaborate um, platform with bullhorns and other stuff around it. And if we look through time here, um, this is again the different phases and then building 12 above it. The internal square meterage doesn't change very much, neither does the, neither does the amount of side room space. The elaboration index uh, does increase uh, through time before the burn and then uh, the, um, the decrease. Uh, the, the burials here show a different pattern with more burials earlier on and then a gradual decline through time. And the, the bins don't really seem to show much, again, much sort of patterning. And uh, the final example I'm gonna give you again from the North area is the sequence from building uh, five to building one. Uh, and uh, as we go through time, the, we get lots and lots of burials and much more elaborate, a lot of elaboration going on. Then this building, this phase is burned. And after the burn, this southern area of the whole building is uh, abandoned and the uh, occupation continues in this small corner, if you like, of the, of the earlier building. <clears throat> so what we're seeing in all of these examples is a cycle of building up ritual elaboration and or the numbers of burials, which is always knocked down in the end before restarting. This happens all the time in the early and middle levels, but especially holds up, sorry, especially builds up to a horizon of burning in level six or South O or North G at around 6,500 uh, BC. So in terms of our now very complex uh, chronology at Chattal, I'm talking particularly about this middle phase, but it happens throughout these earlier middle phases. And then there is this quite a lot of burning that occurs both in the south and the north around this um, end of the middle period around 6,500. So I've been describing a dampening process of some sorts. This dampening is of course typical of egalitarian societies. At Chattel Huyuk, it was clearly an active process that fought against tendencies to accumulate ritual and social power. People tried to build up ritual and social power and become history houses in which people were preferentially buried. But this bubbling up was continually forced back. This is what I mean by an aggressive egalitarianism. So I wanted to talk more about how this might have worked. <clears throat> I think we've gradually come to a fuller understanding of how the egalitarian focus on sharing was organized at Chattelhuyu. And a major contribution to this has been through Camilla Matsukato's work using network analysis in order to uh, look at the relationships between uh, buildings in the different phases at Chattelhuyu. And I'm showing here uh, the, her work on the middle phase. What she's doing here is um, obtaining a large amount of, sorry, changing a large amount of information uh, from buildings. Uh, so these are the, the boxes here, the various variables that she's been looking at. And these are variables uh, such as uh, where the highest platform is in a building, where the platform is with most burial, where um, elaboration and painting occur, um, uh, sort of a range of architectural spatial things but she's also used uh, artifactual evidence um, of uh, obsidian points, uh, chert, um, ceramics, uh, and also archibotanical and faunal remains. So a wide range of variables. You can see all the different variables here with these boxes all over here. And she's looking at these variables in order to see how closely linked uh, houses are in relation to uh, those variables. And the circles here are the, um, the buildings. And so these are buildings organized in terms of their similarity in terms of these variables. 
And one of the most fascinating things that you can't probably can't see this, but uh, but I, I can, is is that the most of these buildings down here are in the north of the site and the north part of the site, and most of these buildings over here are in the south part of the site. So immediately there seems to be some sort of relationship between similarity of uh, the buildings and spatial distance on the on the site with the northern and the southern uh, uh, areas distinguished. But also to some degree these these clusters of similarities are also clusters of closely related buildings. And one of Camilla's main conclusions uh, is that there is a relationship between the similarity between buildings uh, in terms of these variables and their spatial proximity. And in particular, there seem to be suggestions of neighborhoods, uh, as well as this north-south division, there are these neighborhoods or local clusters of, of buildings. And uh, other work has shown this also. So this is the work of Milena Vasic again, uh, this time looking at uh, uh, burial uh, types, their characteristics that seem to be localized. And she's identified a group of buildings here which have distinctive characteristics, characteristics like wooden planks in. Um, and it was interesting is that uh, these, these three buildings here, they occur at different time periods. In other words, these this sort of clustering occurs through time. Uh, this is, there's a sort of linearity to this because the, these three buildings here have long been known to be um, sort of a, a group in some sense, Mellart's Shrines 1, 8, and 10. And these two buildings are, are built on the same platform. And so one of the patterns that I, I think um, one begins to see that's interesting is that you get these sort of linear neighborhoods. And, and, and this group of buildings here um, is, um, adjacent to this area here, which was used for um, a midden area. We, we excavated it as this space uh, here. And if we look more generally at, um, at a later level, uh, or still in this middle phase, we, we see that area of midden here. And then what I try to do in this diagram is to show that there is some sort of um, radiality to the, the abutment of walls in in the middle uh, phase at Chattelhuyu. And I don't know if you can see that terribly well, but here, can you see this line of abutting walls that goes along here? So it's wandering along this way, but it seems to be, seems to have this uh, a linear character. And there's another one here, and the one we've just been um, looking at uh, along here. And these seem to sort of be radially going out from the high point of the, of the southern part of them. Uh, of the site over here, the south submound mound over here. And we see um, <clears throat> the same sorts of things in the, in the north area. Um, again, uh, this is a group of houses that constitute some sort of uh, neighborhood in the way that I've been uh, describing. But we also again see these abutments of walls uh, that seem to have this sort of linear uh, radial um, set of lines. Um, and these seem to be sort of ex uh, expanding outwards as one goes away from the high point of the mound. We can also see in the north area that as well as these neighborhoods and these linear wedges, there are these, um, there's a big sector that's identified by this area, uh, open area or midden or whatever it is, some, some sort of open area that expands like this, that, that separates this whole group of houses here from the whole group of houses over here. <clears throat> so there seems to be a sort of nested hierarchy of spatial groupings. And I would say that this is sort of what seems to underlie the patterning that Camilla found. So far, I've been cheating in presenting this evidence to you. I have given the impression that all these buildings were at the same phase or level and that the spatial groupings were all of contemporary houses. More recently, we've become aware that all that these levels, both Mellart's levels and our levels, have limited validity. A large scale dating program using Bayesian statistics that has been undertaken by Alex Bayliss with uh, over 400 dates so far 
have been obtained, and this has allowed very refined dating. This shows that houses were frequently abandoned for shorter or longer periods of time, and that there are often vacant lots, as well as open spaces or midden areas. In this work, Alex has been able to date the founding duration and abandonment of buildings within 25 year periods. I want to try and show you this uh, now. Um, so this is, I'm using the north area and I'm going to try and show you uh, time slices through 25 year periods from 6650 Cal BC to 6400. And what I'm going to be showing you is the, is the buildings that she thinks, well, that the, the analysis shows are most likely to have been occupied in, in each of these 25 peer, year periods. And also looking at the midden areas, which are shown as these, these, uh, these filled in areas. And later on in the sequence, we'll also see some abandoned lots. And as I go through this, I'm going to go through quite quickly, almost like a sort of movie. I want to go through these um, time slots. And I, I would like you to focus on three things. The first is the way that there's, there's an underlying structure that, that continues through time. And this sort of particular, this radial line here that I showed you before that comes through here. I want you to look at how that continues. Whatever happens, whatever changes around it, that stays the same. Um, so that's one thing to look at. Uh, another thing is the, that there are these continual breaks and changes in building sequence. And the final thing is the thinning out of, of the clustered housing through time as, as the north area gradually gets uh, abandoned. So I'm just going to go through this now. So if, if I go to the next phase, you see things have changed. Uh, and the, the midden area here is uh, changed. But this line that goes through here stays the same. And that continues on through as things change around it. These are these vacant lots now appearing. Uh, and then that, that funny little thing gets squeezed in here. Um, and still that line is, is visible, the vacant lots and things are changing all around it, but it stays the same. Uh, and then finally we get to this, this uh, phase where there are lots of vacant lots and the area is starting to get abandoned. So for the moment, the main point of this was to show that the line of this radial wedge or whatever it is, this sort of structure that goes through it, stays stable through time. Indeed, Amy Bogard and the archaeobotany team argue that there is evidence from weed seeds and other indicators on site that suggests the whole landscape may have been divided into radial segments. These segments may have partitioned the locally diverse wet and dry landscape in equitable ways. The on-site wedges are here shown in relation to the early historic pattern of fields around Chattahuyu. And we are making no suggestion that we've identified the ancient field systems. We're just trying to express the notion of radial divisions. The archaeobotanical evidence also supports Camilla's work on the division of the site at least during part of its occupation into two sub mines, the north and the south, the north area here and the southern area here. The archipotanical evidence supports this, this division that uh, Camilla not noticed. The archipotanical team has found evidence of the introduction of new crops and technologies at different times and rates in the two sub mines, as if the agricultural practices differed between them to some degree. So one form of egalitarian leveling involves the balance and equivalence between nested units. <clears throat> there was an overall nested balance inequality of sharing that provided the limits of aggrandizing that contained it. So groups of houses were balanced with each other within neighborhoods that were balanced against each other in radial segments that were balanced against each other in sectors within submans and within the site as a whole. Lower level groupings were equivalent to each other and nested into high level groupings within an overall spatial system. But this was by no means the only leveling mechanism. 
Camilla in her network analysis also found cross-cutting links between buildings and neighborhoods. And it is certainly the case that many distinctive symbols and traits at Chatelhuyuk are not spatially clustered. For example, the pairs of leopard reliefs are not found in neighboring houses, but spread across the settlement as a whole. And the same is true of the raised arm or bear reliefs. And this, I, I, some time ago, I tried to sort of summarize this cross-cuttingness in this uh, diagram that shows the sort of connections between buildings with leopard reliefs and splayed figures and so on, which, which are sort of spread across the land. And we also now know, of course, that the splayed figures also occur in the northern area. So um, sort of widespread distribution of these, um, these motifs. Uh, and I, I also try to show here again these, uh, these radial segments. <clears throat> but we also, also on this diagram are the, um, the burials. So we're sort of showing here uh, the number of burials in, 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 in some of these buildings. There are too many burials in some houses for that amount of dead to be produced by one house. So for example, we found 62 burials in one house. And some buildings have few or no burials. So it's clear that people were buried preferentially in some houses. We don't know where these people lived, those that were buried in these uh, 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 houses with many burials. We don't know where these people live. They could have been in neighborhoods but there is some evidence to suggest that the co-burying group of people cross-cut the neighborhoods. This is mainly because the houses of the many burials sometimes seem to cluster together themselves, especially in the north area. And so, as I said, we don't know where the people who were buried here lived. But uh, what I've done here is um, uh, sort of notionally show uh, people being buried into this building not only from nearby buildings, but also from other clusters uh, in, uh, in other segments and so on. And it seems to me that the evidence at the moment, to me anyway, suggests that this is the most likely pattern that the burying group was, was co-burying group was larger than and more scattered than uh, the neighborhood group. So let's for the moment assume that the co-burying group cuts across the spatial neighborhoods what is of interest is that there is also evidence that the co-burying group also ate together during life. So this is the work of uh, Jessica Pearson on uh, carbon and nitrogen isotopes of humans uh, in the buildings. And working with Claudia Engel uh, on the statistical evidence, uh, the statistical significance showing that these differences, of course, there's a lot of overlap, but the differences between the buildings in terms of uh, carbon and nitrogen diets is indeed significant. This notion that groups of houses prepared food and ate together is supported by the detailed house, hist house history work of Kevin Kay. And what he's done here this, so this is not just dating. He's looking at a series of buildings and taking the Harris matrix and then looking at a sequence of events, the sequence of events through time in each of these buildings. And then looking at the elaboration index as it changes through time in a building and the number of burials. So you, are, you often get the sort of increase in elaboration through time, but you see burials is sometimes there's a lot early on and then they die out or there may be very few burials through time or the sort of gradual sort of increasing with here. But he's also, which is what I want to focus on here, looking at uh, the number of uh, uh, hearths and ovens and bins in use at any one time. And the important point for the moment is that you see there are often phases uh, in which a building has no hearth or oven, which suggests that um, there must have been some sort of sharing uh, of uh, cooking and food preparation. The absence of hearths or ovens in a house phase suggests that more than one house was involved in food preparation and consumption by the co-burying group. A further example of complex cross-cutting links is provided by the genetic evidence. 
Using dental metrics as a proxy for genetic distance, Pillow and Larson found that those buried together and who ate together were not close genetically. Those buried together in a house were not more closely related than those buried in different houses. This suggests that biological kin was cross-cut by fictive or, pra or practical associations. A person's biological parents were often not in the group that ate together and were buried together. This evidence has been corroborated uh, recently by Mehmet Somel and his group using ancient DNA. The proportion of people in co-bearing groups who are not related is much higher at Chatelhuyuk than the earlier sites such as Ashikla and Bonjuklu. So here we see in this graph here, uh, the, the number of people who are relatives and not relatives uh, in co-burial clusters. And you can see there's a much higher proportion in Ashikla and Bonjuklu, whereas in Chatelhuyuk, a very large number of the people who are in co-bearing groups um, in, in houses are, are, are not relatives. So in summary, I am arguing that in early and especially in the middle phases of Chatelhuyu, there were complex leveling mechanisms based around on the one hand, nested spatial groupings of houses and neighborhoods and so on. And on the other hand, on cross-cutting affiliations and alliances. The nested spatial groupings leveled by creating balance and opposition. The cross-cutting connections can be seen as creating sodalities for the horizontal circulation of food and burial practices and so on. So I am not arguing that Chattelhuyu was a segmentary society of the ideal type shown here in the top left. There have been many and long decades of criticism of that concept and its evolutionary tones. And in any case, there is much evidence that Chattelhuyu does not fit neatly into such a segmentary scheme. But I do think that there is evidence for some form of nested system in which the parts were balanced against each other and in which there were also numerous cross-cutting processes, all of which helped to maintain symmetry and balance. Another way to express the same idea is to look from the point of view of an individual house. Each house in the middle here is part of uh, a neighborhood, which is part of a radial wedge, which is part of a sector, which is part of a submound, which is a part of the mound. So each house, each individual house can call upon members in a wide range of nested groupings, but also in the same way, it can also be called upon by all those entities. In the end, every house is a member of the mound community as a whole. So here I've tried to show these cross-cutting entities, the burial group and the biological kin, and then I've sort of notionally put an idea like the leopard sodality and the bear sodality. And all this is within the mound as a whole. The focus on the mound as a whole returns us to the individual house. So but as you go out to the, the mound, the mound itself has an overall character which returns us to the individual house because each house follows the same codes. Each house participates in the community as a whole by virtue of its following a set of internal rules that although they vary by mound and neighborhood and so on, they are, they are also maintained over the site as a whole. This is an example of the typical layout of a Chattelhuyu house in the middle phase. Everything is always in the same place with different activities on different platforms and sharp boundaries between them. So as I'm sure you're all aware, you have things like curbs and platform edges and benches dividing up uh, platforms and you have the southern area with hearths and ovens and production and so on and do what we call dirty floors and then the northern area which is clean, clean and um, uh, and where you have more adult burial and, and so on. You can see these divisions and marks uh, uh, here. Some of this div dividing and separating is about separating the sacred and the mundane, although these might not be the right words, 
but certainly adult burial and symbolic elaboration were kept separate from production and consumption. So these little things, these curves and edges and so on, are really separating uh, different parts of the, of, the, of the space. And in particular, one could say that they're separating out the clean area associated with burial and ritual, ritual elaboration from the southern area associated with um, uh, production. The adult burial and symbolic elaboration were kept separate from production and consumption. Thus the internal organization of the house helps to prevent the aggrandizement in the burial and ritual sphere from bleeding into the sphere of production and consumption. The internal bounding containing of space denotes the membership of the house actors in the Chattahuyu Y community. But the small platform edges and benches and curves also serve to contain any tendency of burial and ritual aggrandizement to bleed into the control of production. So in summary, what I've been talking about in the early and especially middle levels at Chattahuyuk is one form of egalitarianism. And the, these are the mechanisms that we have seen, symmetry and balance, cross-cutting sodalities, breaking continuity, ending things by burning, breaking, uh, uh, depositing, uh, the separation of domestic and ritual and internalized codes. But there are problems with this type of egalitarianism. One is that the nested and cross-cutting system creates nodal or apical points so that some houses can aggrandize. The conformity to rules and norms can become oppressive. And we have, quite a, we have some evidence that people who didn't fit in became externalized or separated. And of course, uh, providing uh, um, uh, exchange relationships with large numbers of groups within the, this, this type of system has a great, creates demands on labor. And while this type of system allows one to slot in new modules, through time, the nested structure makes additions difficult. And one of the things we see in the middle phase is minute little houses that get squeezed into the overall structure. So a series of problems that gradually emerge through time. And one response to this, uh, apart from just imposing the, the uh, egalitarian system, is to escape from the system and moving to a different type of egalitarian system by building house-based autonomy founded on intensification. And that I want to move now to look at the upper levels after 6500 at Chattel to see how a new form of egalitarianism uh, emerges. One of the things that we see in the upper levels is a reduction in occup the occupation area and, um, and, and spreading out to different parts of the mound and perhaps also to the West Mound, maybe as even as early as six, around 6300. So there is more dispersal and movement around. And we see this very clearly in the South uh, section where in the early and middle levels, we see these sorts of walls built on top of each other through time, house built on house, built on house, built on house. And then, uh, uh, then there is this phase uh, around 6,500 of, um, of a clearing out. Uh, and then when a building starts again, uh, it's uh, often not directly on top of these earlier buildings. And there are again, gaps between each building. So there's less of, con less of a continuity and more open space in these upper levels. Another thing that uh, happens is that the buildings get larger and more um, divided up, more cellular. Uh, we can also see that here. And we also see uh, associated spaces or yards or um, open areas uh, more clearly associated with individual buildings. So here's a building which one third has an entrance through here into this sort of yard area and, and an entrance through here into this sort of southern uh, midden area. So th there's more sort of space, more, more, of a, more of a house being like a sort of, um, almost like a farm, uh, more uh, a, a, a centered around production and consumption. And the independence of houses is indicated in a number of ways. Uh, again, here I'm using Jessica Pearson's work on this time on sheep uh, isotopes uh, and looking at the carbon, uh, the carbon values and their different uh, ranges. 
And, and what we're looking at here is the um, sheet from middens associated with this building here and this building here. And you can see that they're really quite different, suggesting uh, that the, um, the sheep associated with these two buildings were grazed in different parts of the landscape. And an, and an extremely important aspect of this change in the upper levels is, is a very uh, major uh, increase in the dependence on uh, domestic sheep. And so in these upper levels, we get the, a sudden really marked increase in the in the density of uh, sheep bones. And of course, through time, increasingly uh, evidence of the domestication of uh, cattle. So in these upper levels, uh, I don't have time to run through uh, another one of those time slice sequences. But, but if I did do that for you, what you would see was much more open space and much more uh, and very little evidence of that type of structuring that I showed earlier. There's much more sort of variability and change in, in the way the, the settlement is laid out. So in summary, and I've talked obviously much less about these upper levels, but the mechanisms of egalitarian action in the late level seem to be about much less focus on ritual or more focus on domestic production, more focus on mobility and dispersal. We have lots of evidence of uh, sheep and uh, humans traveling uh, uh, more and um, covering lar larger areas of the Konya Plain, but also exchanging and traveling to, to farther distances more. So more mobility and dispersal, uh, more um, autonomy of domestic unions, some evidence of specialization and some and, and st continually continued strong internalized uh, codes. So I'm trying to argue that Chattahuyuk sees an egalitarian transformation leading to intensification and autonomy uh, that involved increased house size, increased house autonomy, agricultural intensification and greater dispersal. And that this was a shift from the molar to the molecular. So I'm starting to use this term. But basically the idea is that um, the problems that built up in the middle phase uh, with a particular type of nested or segmentary structure get um, released by a transformation whereby there is more household autonomy. So this, these terms, molar and molecular, I hope will become clearer uh, as, as, I, as, I, as I carry on. But basically I'm using them to describe a shift from a radially, seg a radially segmented pattern to more autonomy of households. And I want now briefly to look more widely to see if there are other sites and regions that can contribute to this distinction that I've identified at Chattahoyu. And I want to do this by looking eastwards to the Fertile Crescent and skirting over the many relevant and contemporary sites in Cappadocia to the east and the Lake District to the west for, I'd have to leave that for another talk. Indeed, in terms of site structure, Chattahuyu does have similarities with its contemporaries in northern Levant. The similarities with the eight hectare and long lasting 11 meter high mound at Halula are particularly uh, striking. And recently I, I have written a paper with Peter Ackermans and Hannah Plug on the similarities between Tel Sabi Abiyad uh, and Chattahuyu. But there is a strange aspect to Chattelhuyuk, which seems to be sort of a throwback to earlier uh, symbolism. And this is a diagram produced by Helmer and others, including Daniel Stauder, in which they're looking through time at these different periods from the PPNA and at the animal symbolism. And you can see that in the uh, PPNA, uh, early PPNB, there is um, a wide range of animals that are, that are shown in the art, which tends to disappear in the uh, late, later PPNB. But Chattelhuyuk is up here somewhere, and yet it has all of these animals except uh, scorpions. So it, it seems in some ways, you know, closer to these much earlier uh, sites. And there is also um, a sort of throwbackness uh, 
in relation to uh, the idea of radiality and segmentation, at least I, I would argue that. And I want to look uh, briefly at Gebekli. The, this wonderful map um, produced by Kinzel and, and Claire that um, allows us to see because of the, the dating, uh, how, how the site developed and the way that these circles develop through time and are all contemporary with, with each other. And along with the, along with the um, geophysics, th this absolutely suggests not a single community, but a segmented one. Claire and Kinzel uh, suggest that the segments resulted from the agglomeration of people from abandoned sites in the region. The circles themselves are all about not centers, but balance and radial division. And so rather than having one central um, monolith, there are two of these pairs that are always balanced against each other. And then you have this radial division uh, uh, around them, dividing uh, the space in, in that way. And perhaps I, I'm uh, imposing this, but what one perhaps sees in, in this uh, arrangement of buildings outside some continuation of that sort of radiality, at least in some phases. There seems to be quite a diversity of buildings uh, at Gobekli, but perhaps arranged in some sort of radial format. There is also burning and filling in and rebuilding, like at Chatal, and perhaps an overall tension between the circles and the increasing importance of the house or other small uh, rectangular buildings through time. And these smaller house-like buildings seem to take on the ritual functions and, and, ultimately the and ultimately the circles are allowed to or are filled in. And this could all be read as a gradual shift from the more molar to the more molecular. The labor demands of building and rebuilding these impressive circles may have contributed to the shift to greater house autonomy. So the molecular is here then seen as a response to the problems of the molar. And perhaps also a response to the dangers of aggrandizement. Flannery and Marcus suggest that perhaps each descent group competed with the others and that the enclosures brought great renown to the leaders who organized the labor. We see the same tension at Jeff El Amar. On the one hand, there is much evidence of balance and symmetry. And you, of course, have these sort of radial divisions uh, in a range of uh, sites. And this shows some of uh, Daniel Storder's uh, vision of the symmetry and arrangement of buildings at, at uh, Jeff. Uh, here, for example, this axis in this communal building she sees as dividing one group of buildings over here from another group of buildings over there. <clears throat> the way the site plan develops at Jeff El Amar, it is as if there are modules associated com with communal buildings with radial divisions in what is perhaps storage. There are also what are described as communal food preparation buildings. There is a separation of ritual and mundane. At least in some phases, the site, the site is divided into two halves. There is much evidence of the burning of buildings. And in my view, many of the objects left in abandoned buildings there should be seen as abandonment rituals rather than the result of sudden departure. On the other hand, Storder also sees some evidence of inequality and imbalance. She wonders whether the burned building with bullhorns in the middle phase could be seen as a chief's house. She sees some buildings nearer to the communal buildings as more privileged and talks of their authority. So again, the molar focus on balance and symmetry is set against this potential inequality. There are, of course, similar emphases on symmetry and radial division at several sites, such as Murebet, Talabra III, and reportedly at Chemka Hoyuk on the Upper Tigris. Going farther afield, the layout of the special building at WF16 almost looks to me as if an anthropologist was using the building to explain the rudiments of a classic segmentary society in this arrangement uh, here. And this is the symmetry as, as outlined by the, the team. 
The highly structured communal building contrasts with the domestic architecture in which no two buildings seem to be the same. Segmentation in the PPNA is perhaps also seen in the four so-called granaries at Dra. And Kite and Finlayson argue that, quote, many granaries would have been in use simultaneously. Coming nearer in time to Chatal at uh, Ashikla, uh, um, again, one can argue that one can see a radial organization here, and which is highly structured uh, through time, the separation of the sacred and the, and the profane. But again, in, in this wonderful diagram that Ganesh has produced uh, of the continuity of buildings through time at, at Ashikla, um, we, we again see some sort of differentiation between some buildings that seem to have uh, burials and hearths and others that, that don't, uh, suggesting some potential of a di differentiation. All this led me to wonder whether at different times in different places, there was a general move from one type of egalitarian system to another across Southwest Asia and including Central Anatolia. Early on, there, there occur agglomerated sites with more focus on ritual and nested structures that create balance and symmetry. And later on, there is greater house autonomy. In, in the Levant and Northern Mesopotamia, there is a change especially starting at the middle PPNB and on into the pottery Neolithic. The very use of the terms grill, channeled, cell to describe the houses at Chainu and elsewhere capture some of the new emphasis on molecular entities. Through the sequence from Nabali Chori through Chayanu, we see the increasing internal elaboration of the house and practices such as infilling and rebuilding in place. Despite the overall focus on the repetition of similar units at Chayanu, Erim Erzdawan said that, quote, that the north of the plaza were the houses of the elite. So again, the tension recurs. Ackermans and Schwartz describe how part of the pattern of settlement on the Euphrates in the later eighth and seventh millennia as sites such as Abu Huraira, Alula and Bukras is regularity, order and conformity in the layout of house construction and repeated occupation of buildings over hundreds of years. For Halula, Borel and Molist say that the interacting households, quote, formed the basic organizational unit like the cells form a body. This phrase captures nicely the main theme of the molecular. And these are increasingly productive units. In discussing middle PPNB to, to pottery Neolithic Akarchai, Erzbasharan and Duru suggest that after the early PPNB, early PPNB sites along the Rufetes, like Gritilla, Mazra, Halula and Sabaya II, Sorry, um, so in discussing middle PPNB to pottery Neolithic Akachai, as Basharan and Duru suggest that after the early PPNB, sites along the Euphrates like Gritilla, Mazara, Halula, and Sabi Abiyad too are, quote, more domestic in character. For the Southern Levant, Bird suggested that, quote, household autonomy increased over time. More generally, a progression from relatively undifferentiated overall buildings to more elaborate internally divided rectangular buildings occurred throughout Southwest Asia during the Neolithic, uh, according to Bird. Goring Morris and Belfer Cohen in 2020 saw a process of increased privatization based around the nuclear extended family and in the PPNB property rights in relation to house, land and animals. At Ayn Ghazal, Rolofson says that, quote, the size and arrangement of middle PPNB architecture suggests that each household was a nuclear family and essentially an independent production and consumption unit. I would like to talk about this broad shift as from the molar to the molecular. That is from one type of egalitarian system to another, from an egalitarian system that is often segmented, modular, nested, and balanced to one that is molecular, where one 
might use other terms such as village, collective, association or assemblage. And that the mechanisms of a molar egalitarian action are symmetry and balance, cross-cutting solities, breaking continuity, the separation of domestic and ritual. And, and I haven't had a chance to talk about this sadly, but I think it's very interesting. People like Graeber and Fowles also argue that these type, in these types of society, they often have an imagined monstrous world that warns against what happens if power is not contained. And this seems a wonderful def description of, of symbolism, both at Gebekli and at uh, Chatal. Whereas the mechanisms of molecular egalitarian action in involve increasingly less ritual focus, more focus on domestic production, al allowing mobility and dispersal, more domestic unit autonomy, specialization, internalized codes, and overall just more independence in, and in intensification. It's important to emphasize that I'm not saying these are categories of sight, rather they are tendencies or tensions present in all Neolithic societies to greater or lesser degrees. And that the molar promotes, and so, and the molar, uh, both of these have positive and negative aspects. The molar particularly promotes equal share, sharing and perhaps um, provides a mechanism for adding new modules, but it can be oppressive, mainly because of the labor costs of these social demands, that the social demands uh, have a very extensive um, uh, uh, dem demands from e the economic system. And perhaps through time also it becomes difficult to incorporate additions, but particularly there is this danger of dominant groups controlling the apexes. And so there's often a move to the molecular, which pr promotes much diverse decision making, is much more fl flexible and allows a more easy fissioning, fissioning and dispersal. But it depends on economic intensification and associated labor costs. <laughs> So my suggestion or hypothesis is that because of the negatives of the molar PPNA system, and especially the labor costs of social demands, especially when involving the Gobekli enclosures or the Jericho Tower, and the danger of dominant groups controlling the apexes in the nested system, there was a long slow revolution from the middle PPNB onwards, in which there was a gradual turn to the molecular system. So this was a revolution in order to retain or regain egalitarian principles. The focus of this revolution was towards intensification and autonomy, or to put it really crudely, to escape the, sh to escape the shackles of places like Gebekli or early Chatar. Asuti and uh, Fuller have a nice chart that shows how the intensification of agriculture through the phases of cultivation and domestication led to an increase in the input of human labor. And they're showing that down here, the sort of increased input of human labor through time and the increased yield uh, through time. So why would people undertake the harder work of agriculture? One answer is to say, because they wanted or needed higher yields. And the, diag the diagram does indeed show an increasing yield per unit area of land. But why did they want higher yields? there needs to be some forward push that seeks higher yields. I'm suggesting the hypothesis that the forward push for higher yields emerged as people try to maintain egalitarian societies in response to the demands of the molar structures. The shift to molecular that occurred in the middle PPNB and onwards in the Levant and Upper Mesopotamia fueled the process of intensification. Being autonomous depended on more intensive agricultural systems that linked caprine herding and manuring in fixed plot intensive horticulture. Peters, uh, Perlet and Arbuckle argue uh, that the transition from the early PPNB to the middle PPNB saw the completion of the Neolithic barnyard with domesticated sheep and cattle integrated into crop manuring systems and that this fueled the spread of Neolithic technologies within and outside of the Fertile Crescent region. I want to add that this economic transition was itself fueled by the start of a shift 
to a molecular social mode, itself an egalitarian revolution. So in drawing to a close, I want to emphasize that um, I, you know, I, these words, molar and molecular, um, I'm partly using because they, um, they don't have quite the baggage that many other terms uh, use. Uh, I, the, I, I'm mainly taking it from Deleuze and Guattari's book, A, a Thousand Plateaus. But what I, rather than saying, you know, one has to have these, you have to use these terms, I, I want to encourage a broader discussion. That's my main point. We tend to talk in rather limited terms of things like ranking or communal buildings or integrative architecture or autonomous households and so on. But there is, uh, I would suggest, a potential for using a much broader vocabulary that we might use to discuss a Neolithic organization. And these are just some examples. I don't, I'm not suggesting these line up with the molecular, but they are um, themes that one could explore, uh, like organic and mechanical solidarity of Durkheim or Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft, or the other term in Deleuze and Guattari of territorialize and deterritorialize and, and so on. So I'm, I'm just uh, uh, suggesting that, that it would be of interest to try and uh, um, have a broader discussion of, of, of such terms and oppositions and see how they relate to the, uh, the Neolithic uh, evidence. So in conclusion, um, many archaeologists have talked of some form of blending between hierarchical and egalitarian forms in the Neolithic of the Middle East. This question can be rephrased in terms of egalitarianism as an active process trying to find the best way to combat concentrations of power. The two main egalitarian processes in the Neolithic of the Middle East I've described as molar and molecular. And the hypothesis is that through time, the molecular tended to win out, the shift to the molecular promoting agriculture as well as the spread of farming. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Ian. Uh, I'm moving to series um, to discuss an important conceptual part of neotization, uh, which is how community constructed itself by time. And, and Ian mentioned like, aggressive egalitarianism as a mechanism with catalytic detail and with behavioral analysis with the molar and molecular. Um, as you mentioned already, we have same kind of mechanism, I think, in Ashikli, but also similar temporal changes in almost all asp aspects, but especially in regards to the emergence of houses, household autonomy, increasing number of buildings and relatively social and economic and technological changes. It's actually seen at Ashikli too, of course, in, in a different scales, I think. Um, we see sometimes discuss, uh, discussions of whether the people from Ashikta went to or found, founded Shatal after abandonment of Ashikta or not. If their social and technological memories were not erased, uh, it seems unlikely that people went somewhere else founded a new village and went through the same social, economic and technological changes all over again. So, uh, just a comment. Are there any questions? Uh, hello, may I ask a question? Yes. Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you for such a uh, very interesting talk. I have a two, two question in there. The first one is about the DNA analysis that you have uh, shown about the different sites, uh, including Chatal Huk. Uh, so uh, based on that, we've uh, understood that the, the population that you were been discussing about Chatal Huk were not relatives, mostly. So uh, do you think what was the privilege of Chataliu to attract a large number of people at, the, at some point 
in the way that we found it at some point at the only site in the in the, in the Hunia Plain Central uh, Anatolia. And my second question is about the burden uh, uh, structure that you mentioned. We see some burn structure, not only at Chatal, but also at the other uh, Neolithic site, more or less. Do you think this was a, a kind of the usual uh, treatment of uh, when the sites were being uh, abandoned during the Neolithic, or was it intentional or accidental? Thank you. Thank, thank you. Um, So um, it, partly also in response to uh, Gunish's uh, point um, uh, about whether Ashoka, Ashoka people moved to, moved to Chattel, um, the we, we of course have you know local sequences at Jan Hassan and um, at Banjuklu, and and I certainly agree with uh, Douglas that I think there are a lot of continuities between uh, Banjuklu and Chattel, and so and so. Um, and, and of course, Douglas found in, in earlier work, uh, survey work, that there were a number of these sort of sites prior to Chattel that, that, that um, may have been drawn in to, to the site itself. And I think part of my interest in what, why, why is it that Chattel looks, looks so like um, somewhere like Gebekli would, would be the, would be that all that symbolism and the radiality were somehow associated with this issue of bringing lots of people in and and I do think that one could argue that that segmentary structure works very well initially as slotting in new things but of course it fills up at some point um, why, why people uh, came into Chattel um, I mean I think there are a huge number of, of attractive advantages of those types of uh, very, very complex system, uh, but particularly providing buffers. If you've, got a, if you've got a system where you're using a wide range of resources in the landscape, that I think that a very highly structured social system is, is very attractive in, in, because it means that if, if, you, if you have failure or loss, there are many, many other people that you can depend on. And it's a very sort of very safe network, if you like, very, very complex mesh within, within which you have a sort of safety, if you like. But of course, it has, also has its demands. So that, that's what, I mean, I, I presume that's the sort of process that was, was going on. Your question about burning is very, very interesting. Of course, you know, we've, we've struggled endlessly at Chattel uh, to have uh, debates about whether the burning of buildings was intentional or not. And, um, and, I, and I don't know, I mean, I'm speaking, <laughs> my, my own perspective is that there's a sort of consensus that much of it was intentional. Um, and, and of course, it's very it's a difficult thing at all sites to, to work out whether the burning is, is intentional or not. Um, but I, I, I'm just very struck at Chattel by the way that the burning sort of starts at a particular horizon. You know, there's many, many levels of no burning, and then suddenly there's lots of burning. And that suggests to me that, um, that, that it's part of a social process in some way or other. Um, and, um, and at a Chattel, it's often very, very structured. You know, it's associated with deposition of lots of stuff, you know, breaking things. You know, um, Chris, uh, Christine Saraki has, show, has shown uh, the breaking of ground stone and things associated with this burning and, and ending. And we have lots of cleaning and filling in and covering over. You know, it just seems like they, they prepare a stage and then they burn it. And, and so it, it just, um, I, I, and so I do wonder whether, whether it's part of this sort of leveling mechanism that, that when things get too, too elaborate, then you know you have to end it, and and one way of ending it is burning. And and as I, as you say, and as I, I said in my talk, you, you get bur burning occurring many 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 very very common uh, pattern across the the Middle East. Um, I think Trevor has a question. Please, Trevor. Thank you, Ian. I, that was, that was a, a fantastic paper. I, I, I really enjoyed it. I've got pages and pages of notes and a whole heap of things that I have to go away and try and find to read. Um, uh, I've always been puzzled, um, well, for a long time, I've been puzzled by sites like Ashikler and, and 
and chateau. Uh, um, because if people who are uh, living there are living by essentially horticulture and pastoralism, it's not agriculture and farming as we understand it. They've got no wagons, they've got no beasts of burden, they've got nothing to pull the plow. It's essentially horticulture. And um, it's uh, um, economically, it's, uh, it's illogical to gather such a large number of people uh, together um, to farm uh, in, in the, even in a fertile area like that alluvial fan for, that that uh, Tato has, uh, because the task of, of cultivating and bringing home the crops from the the you know the edges of their their cultivated area are just huge. It makes much more sense to have the previous uh, system, which uh, you you mentioned just a little minute ago, with, a moment ago, with the Douglas. Uh, uh, documented with their field survey with, with uh, uh, um, a, a network of, of much smaller settlements. And I, I really don't understand what it is that pulls so many people together for so long. It's also, it's for, it's for quite a period of centuries that you've got a, a really large and increasingly large population coming together uh, to live in what are essentially more and more difficult and challenging conditions. And I don't, I, for, I think, you know, for us, it's it's normal. We we know about cities. We live in cities. Uh, um, they they've been very necessary to the to the way of life we've had for the last two or three hundred, four hundred years, uh, in particular. But uh, what brought, brought so many people to live together in such close dependence on each other um, is is I think still puzzling. Thank you for that puzzle, Trevor. <laughs> <laughs> I I am. Um... I, I should, one, one thing I should say is that I, I didn't have time to talk about an, another arm of the new evidence, which is that if you take Alex Bayliss's um, uh, time slices, it, it, many of the houses that we thought are contemporary are clearly not contemporary. And, and so it, it radically changes the population estimates. And so actually the numbers aren't terribly high. Uh, if you, if you, if you um, uh, extend her patterning across the whole site and make some assumptions, of course it's always difficult, um, but you account for the vacant lots and the, and the open areas, uh, at the maximum you get something much closer to 1,000 rather than to 3,000 or 8,000. So, so it's, it's not such a huge concentration. I, I don't know, um, I, I think at once I asked Gunesh and Miriban what they thought about Ashiklun, I, I think they gave me some numbers not so dissimilar from, from that. So, so, I, so the numbers aren't, I, I don't think it's such a massive change. And, and of course it's, it, it's um, you know, there are many other mega sites and, 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 and there's the same issue with all of them, you know, how, how many of them, were, how much of them were actually occupied together. So I don't know, that's not an answer to your puzzle, I, but I, I, I it reduces and, and I'm not, sorry? It reduces it. Yes. <laughs> that, it means I don't have to stay awake so long at night but, uh, worrying about it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, I think it's Eleni first, and then Juano. Juano, after Eleni, please, you can ask yourself. Okay. Uh, let me lower my hand first. Ian, this was brilliant. Uh, I, it might be the lockdown, the long, long, long lockdown, but I found it very... Uh, very uh, exciting as a concept. And I had missed this sense of intellectual excitement probably because of the lockdown. Uh, I have a question for you though. Uh, and it arises from your comparison or your interrogation of this concept of um, molar and molecular concepts of egalitarianism. When you try to see how it might unfold in other sites and other time slices outside Chattal. Uh, I got the feeling from this presentation that this continuum from molar to molecular probably transcends time. So in that sense, it is not necessarily representative of 
the transition, if you want, from foraging to farming. And I picked that up, especially when you showed that old graph of mine and Dorian's from that paper. Um, in that sense, I mean, Chattal post dates the transition, okay? We have from the very beginning, uh, in the broadest possible sense, an economy that is founded, predicated on the exploitation of domesticated animals and plants, okay? So, and then you spoke about, you brought up this wonderful uh, plan of Gebekli, um, exploring such patterns at uh, the slice of time that predates Chattel considerably. So does the transition, does the, the, the continuum from molar to molecular have to do probably with specific settlement patterns? Is it something that you see specifically in aggregation sites? rather than, let's say, sedentary sites? Is it large aggregations that bring out this uh, um, transformation of concepts or expressions of egalitarian uh, structures? And in that sense, are we moving perhaps from, let's say, the old routine focus on sedentism as the foundation of the Neolithic transition towards aggregations. And I use here ag aggregations as a byword for mega sites, which is by now a bit of a slightly tired concept. So does it transcend time or it, does it have some sort of evolutionary significance as you might as I, I thought, at least, you were suggesting in your presentation. Yeah, that, that's great, Eleni. Thank you. I mean, it sort of gets to the nub of the problem. And, and um, I, you know, I think part of my problem in giving the talk is that uh, Chattel is a strange mixture in, 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 the, in the scheme that I've set out. It's a strange mixture because it's in a molecular time frame, you know, it, 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 contemporary sites in northern Mesopotamia are all very, you know, like Halula and so on, and Sabi Abiyad, they're all very molecular. And Chattel fits in with that in many ways, uh, as you say. Uh, and, and yet, on the other hand, I suppose I was trying to argue that it's in a molar position in a local sequence. And, and so I had this idea that maybe, um, and, and, and I'm not quite sure what you're saying about aggregation, but if you're saying that, uh, if you're arguing that many uh, early sites are sort of more aggregation sites in, in that they're um, uh, bringing in people from around, the, you know, that both Chattel and Gebekli and Ashikla are all bringing people in from around. And then later on in the sequence, you know, they become more, um, you know, that, 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 that bringing people in from around becomes, that doesn't work anymore. And, and, and what people really want to do is escape. You know? <laughs> and, and, and so you build up the molar, then you want to escape. And, and I should absolutely emphasize that I'm not seeing it as an evolutionary, I mean, I see it as a local, a local sequence, but clearly, you know, in, in bronze, you see, you see this sort of, radial segmentary structure in Bronze Age sites. You see it in, um, um, you know, the classic Kukateni Tripoli sites, those amazing, you know, huge, enormous things which are organized in that sort of very segmentary radial way. So you see it all over the place. Um, and you see the contrast, say, with a, you know, land, the band ceramic, more, more village type of molecular thing. So you see it all over the place. And, per, and in fact, I, I would see it on, any, on, a, on a particular site. I, I think you can see at Jeff, for example, that near the near the um, communal buildings, it looks more molar and more structured and organized. And where, but as you, as you go away from the communal buildings, it's more molecular and chaotic. And perhaps you see the same in China. I'm not, not sure, but um, 
you know, so I, I see on the same site, you could have the, these two emphases, which are really about, you know, do we have structure or do we have dispersal? And how, and how do we link these two things together? And so I think that's a continual process go, that goes through the Neolith and comes back in different areas, different times, in different ways. Uh, it's very complicated and, and local and very, but, but it, it, it's just a way of thinking about that. I guess what I was trying to, by aggregation, probably most likely the wrong choice of term, but do you think or do you associate this continuum from molar to molecular, let's say with larger sites where you have larger groups of people living or also sites that are more long lived with others? In other, uh, other words, are there certain preconditions that you see as, you know, essential for this transformation of egalitarian behaviors to take place? That yeah. place that I, I, um, can impose certain limitations on the resource base or people's relationships or the longevity of, uh, you know, sodalities or the structuring and so on. And, that, that's, yeah. I guess, what I was trying to say. Yeah, I, I don't know, Eleni. I, I mean, I, my, um, my sense is that this molar molecular distinction cross-cuts uh, what you're talking about is aggregation and dispersal. So, so that you have, you know, you can have somewhere like um, uh, Tel Sabi Abiyad that, um, uh, that seems, to allow a lot of dispersal and movement. Um, whereas, and, and it's just very difficult to tell from the evidence sometimes, but, but other, 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 other of those PPNB sites seem to be much more stable and long-term. Um, and of course you have very large sites, going into the pottery Neolithic, you have very large sites um, so, which, and so I don't think, I don't, I don't know that there's a simple correlation between size and, um, and this distinction or, or between dispersal in that system. Uh, Ian, Ian Kite, I think your question is related with this debate. Hmm? Your microphone, your mic microphone. Oh, sorry. <laughs> No problem. I think there was actually somebody else first uh, yes. who was in well, line. Who want to ask something, but if, if your question is related with this one? It is certainly related to this one. Okay. Yes, yes. Um, okay, so thank you very much, Ian. Uh, very, as always, a very interesting and provocative talk, uh, and clearly a subject that I'm warm to. The whole the whole conversation about how do we frame social relationships in terms of these ongoing tensions of, um, of some forms of differentiation and some forms of interconnectivity is I think absolutely critical. So the questions I have for you here, sort of thinking about your, what I'll just term the m, &M model for this, you provide something sort of this descriptive and functional framework for some of this. And there's two parts to this that I'd like to hear a little bit more of. Uh, first of all, it strikes me that a lot of this in some ways is really network based and that that's the core of a lot of what you're framing here. And so I'm not entirely sure your molecular molar, how that really advances that as opposed to in some ways uh, moves conversations away from that. So that's just one thing to think about. The second one is sort of thinking further in terms of how you've structured this. Uh, this is, I would assume this is going to be your next current anthro piece that you're going to be producing in some capacity with conversations here. Um, one of the things that you're not entirely doing, you're sort of skating around a little bit, is talking about the nature of decision making and social relationships in this. This strikes me as very much a framing of new social relationships or or going back and forth in some form. But it was interesting to hear the language you were using and the terms you were using were not that of the individual. Occasionally there's conversations of the household, but it was in terms of things such as the houses participated in the whole, the mounds, the neighborhoods, but there wasn't much in the way of any kind of conversation about either individuals or families. 
And yet we know that that's an absolutely critical part to all of this, is that these relationships that we're talking about are being vectored by individuals and on the smaller scale. So I'd be really interested in pushing a little further to hear what you have to say about how do you go from those, that bigger framing towards one of thinking about what is really going on vis-a-vis -vis decision making and and the kind of um, the kind of relationships that are existing at an individual level, uh, perhaps within a small family, but thinking in terms of the smaller scale relationships, which, from my standpoint, that's the driver of these kinds of things. So, thanks again. Thank you, Ian. Um, I. The, the first point about network analysis, um, I, I, I can't see on my screen whether Camilla is here. Maybe she should um, re respond to this and do, if you are around somewhere, Camilla, do, do, do come in. But um, I mean, she, she, she was using network analysis and I think that uh, has proved a really wonderful and very effective mechanism. And I think her results are absolutely uh, spectacular. Um, I, you know, we, we have much less evidence, uh, sadly, from the late levels. And, and so, um, but, but nevertheless, she does, she does find a clear change in the way the network is structured. So, so you're, you're right that we're all, we're looking all the way through time here at a, at a, a, at a network framework. But it is allowing us to say, for example, that neighborhoods are very strong or that the relationship between similarity and distance is very strong in the middle levels, but is not, is not strong in the late levels, for example. So, so it does allow us a way of looking at, um, looking at structure. I mean, I'm scared of using the term structure, but anyway, um, it, it allows us to, to get at some sense of the organization of the social system, e even though it's all through a network analysis um, lens. And I, and I hope at some point in the future that we can use other forms of analysis to try to explore these things more fully. Um, you, you know, your, your other question about um, what it means for people, I mean, I'm entirely with you on that. And I, I, I um, you know, I wish that I could talk in a, in a more in-depth way about that. I, I, I've been so, sort of blown away by, um, for example, uh, the work that has been done on the ancient DNA at Bonjuklu, where we linked to uh, isotopic evidence, where you can build these amazing um, stories about, you know, people being born here and then moving there, and they're coming over from somewhere else and they're moving in, in, joining this, this, this household group and so on. I mean, I, I'm really, I think that's absolutely wonderful. And I, I'm, you know, we're, we're struggling at Chatar with the survival of the ancient DNA. And, but I hope that at some point um, we will have more linking between the ancient day, DNA and the isotopic evidence so, so that we can start talking about people's life histories and their traveling around and doing things and so on and so forth. Um, and, and also talking much more about the lives of men and women as, as different and where, you know, how, how that, where, you know, is it really the case as it seems to be that there's, there's a sort of very patrilocal type of system with women moving around more and so on. So there, there's a lot, much more I would like to do just at the moment I feel slightly hindered or hampered in contrast to the work that they've been able to do at Bonjuklu, just because of our survival rates and problems. But Nevet Samal is doing a wonderful job at squeezing out more ancient DNA. And I hope that by the end of the year, we'll have bigger samples so we can try and write these individual stories. Can okay. I just follow up? Um, so take it one step further. You're talking about houses participating in a whole, you're talking about this bigger model. What's going on in terms of people making decisions? Because Households and neighborhoods don't make decisions. It's one of a household, depending on how you're framing it, does. So that's what I'm interested in hearing a little further about is what you see in terms of changes in authority, power. If there are these tensions in, in, in um, egalitar 
egalitarian worlds of um, and broadly framed, of course, not in sort of Hayden-esque framing. So what do you see is going on then in terms of, of uh, people within the household and with uh, in individuals? Do you see any differences through time with that so that you're connecting it to your model? Yeah, Th those are great questions, Ian. Um, and I'm not sure how far I can go down that line. Um, I, much as I would like to, and maybe you're right that I haven't tried to think that through more clearly, and, and I'll try and do that. You're, you're, you're providing a, um, an impetus to do that. I, I, I guess what I had seen, the way I saw it, was that in terms of decision-making, now, so we have some evidence that age is important. So, so I guess that I, I, I see um, sort of community-wide, I mean, when I'm, I mean site-wide uh, elders who are in some sort of um, uh, sort of village council type, type thing. Uh, and, and that um, at least in the middle phase, there are uh, sort of subgroups of these people that they come together so so that you have you know that the elders in a house the elders in a, in a neighborhood the elders in a segment the elders in a sector so they come together for different purposes and different reasons they come together at different points in time and make decisions and that through various mechanisms uh, like ridicule and so on that they, they make things they, they sort of police the whole system and make sure that everybody's you know, putting their heart in the right place in the house and so on. So th th there is that sort of thing uh, going on, but that you have people pushing against it all the time. So that, that individual houses are sort of try trying to break the system and, and build up more, so more social and um, religious power by bringing in, you know, more burials into their house and having more elaborate rituals and so on and so forth. They're, they're competing with each other. So there's this tension all the time between the, the sort of overall decision-making and, and these individual groups at, at various scales who are trying to try, to try and buck the system in some way. And then when they, at some point, uh, the group as a whole, meaning, meaning one of these larger scale groupings, sectors or segments of the whole community, decides that you know, things have got too far, we, we need, this needs to close off now, we're going to have a burning ritual that ends this. So that's the way I would see it, but that when you go through into the later phase, that um, I, I would suggest that the, the, this larger structure begins to break down, and that individual households are acting much more independently and without reference to the larger, larger scheme. Thank you. Juan, That's a great question. Juan, are you here? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for this very interesting conference. Uh, I was wondering if it is possible uh, to maintain this molar model of society without a, a big uh, quantity of uh, coercion, violence. And my question is uh, if you find, whether you find indications of coercion, repression, uh, or violence uh, at Chetal. So thank you very much for that uh, question. And of course, the relationship between coercion and egalitarianism is something that's been uh, discussed um, by anthropologists uh, uh, for over a long period of time. And um, I, my view is that it's possible to have these types of egalitarian system, which are based largely on things like ridicule and, um, and exclusion of, var of various sorts. And I, I, I envisage Chattal as quite an oppressive society where, where you know, the, the things that I was talking about with Ian are, are really quite strongly imposed. But then they're not imposed by coercion, by violence. They're imposed by uh, the authority of these elder, of these elder statesmen, if you like, and stateswomen. And and so we 
we don't at Chattal uh, have a lot of evidence of obvious violence uh, in the sense of arrowheads or spearheads stuck in spines or, or parry marks on arms or cuts through the head. We don't, we don't have that. Um, but what we do have, and there's very interesting work uh, now done by the human remains team uh, at Chattahuyuk, um, particularly by Chris Knussel and his uh, common colleagues, um, that has looked at um, what they call blunt force trauma on the skull, of which there is quite a bit. But none of this, uh, and, and they plotted it out and they, f they feel that it's not, an, it's not an, a result of falling over or banking, bonk, bonking your head by accident. So that they see this as part of some sort of ritual practice. So I can imagine that as part of what I was talking about with Ian, that the, one of the ways in which you um, maintained uh, egalitarianism was that there would be these ritual fights. I, I did work in, in, in East Africa where there were groups who, they, they would, young, younger men would come and they would beat each other up. Um, not to kill each other, but just to beat each other up. And it was part of a ritual process. And, and, I, and I can imagine things like that happening as part of this sort of leveling egalitarianism that, that, that's going on. Or maybe it's a sort of a release valve for, for violence. Um, we, we do have some evidence that people who was, were odd or different, disabled in some way, were excluded. And this is what I mean by saying it's a very, could be a very oppressive society. So that people who didn't fit in were, were buried outside the house, which is relatively rare. But I, I, I guess I mainly imagine that people that didn't like it left. And of course, the, you know, there's a whole argument that people like Eric Marciniak has made that you, you've got to build up a population at Chattel that then leads to, to people spreading out into different parts of Anatolia. Um, so that it's a sort of source of movement of people there's people escaping you know, from, from the system. Uh, and um, I, I, um, so I, I don't know if that really helps explain, but, but, I, but so basically there's no, there's no obvious violence, but a lot of it may have been externalized in some way. Okay, uh, Mariana. Two very brief questions after I say thank you to you for your wonderful talk. Um, as we know, uh, socials, uh, societies invest a lot of work to maintain themselves as egalitarian. Uh, do you think at some point this is, some, this is a conscious process that individuals have the, the idea or the goal that keeping uh, egalitarianism is something good, something social value, is the first question. And this Second is, even with such mechanisms, at some point, those mechanisms failed and ranking uh, societies will appear. Uh, why do you think that happens? Thank you so much. Uh, so those are very um, philosophical questions. Um, I... Um, I, you know, um, agree with um, Pierre Clast that um, egalitarianism is an active choice, and Ian has made the same, the same point. Um, what, one of the problems with Clastre is that he is saying that, um, uh, in a way, that people trying to escape from state the state and from ranking and hierarchy. But of course, he's often talking about societies that have never seen the state or seen ranking. So what, what, how is it that they don't want to become ranked when they haven't seen ranking? Uh, and um, I guess uh, my feeling is that there were, lots of, there, were, there were lots of examples of ranking going back into the Paleolithic and, uh, and onwards. And so that it was around all the time and that, you know, um, the construction of the circles that Gobekli suggests some sort of leadership and so on, um, and uh, the tower at Jericho and so on and so forth. So that the, 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 the potential 
is always there for ranking and difference. But that these societies are, are ones that have a very strong commitment, an ethical, moral commitment to sharing and equality. And that that is an active process. It's an active notion that it's wrong to have inequality. Um, and I think that's something we can learn from. As, as to you know, why ranking does emerge, um, I, I would prefer to dodge, <laughs> dodge that question really. Um, you know, I, I, um, I, I'm not sure that one can really talk about ranking uh, developing in the Middle East until the early Bronze Age or later. I, I, I you know, people like uh, Frangipane have argued that it goes on uh, through um, into, North, into Mesopotamia until really quite late. And there's no real ranking until very late. So I, 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 I don't, and, and of course we have to be careful what we mean, but I mean, I'm saying that proper institutionalized ranking, I think is potentially really late. So I, I um, uh, yeah, and I, and I would hesitate to give a general reason why that, why that occurred. Well, thank you for your question. Um, I think it's Bilal has a question and Sarah will help to Bilal. Sarah? Uh, I'll ask actually uh, two questions. The first is uh, Bilal Toprak's and then I'll, I have a very small question. Uh, he asks, uh, considering the complex symbolism in Gebekli and Topal, uh, what term would you prefer to define uh, or to explain uh, the belief system during the Neolithic? Would it be religion or belief? And if it's not religion, um, wouldn't be uh, wouldn't this mean uh, to have a, a linear understanding? of history if you're not going to define it as religion. Uh, this is the first one. Uh, and I have a question. It's uh, how can we, do we archeologically uh, define the misfit individuals or um, households um, at Chatal or uh, the, uh, any other site uh, we discussed today? And another one is about the aftermath uh, of this process. Um, how did this uh, uh, sort of molecular version of egalitarianism uh, dissolve through time? And uh, how can we track this again archaeologically in, for instance, Anatolia or Southwest Asia? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure I entirely understood the, the first uh, question. Um, uh, the, the linear the linear aspect of it but i um you know i i'm aware that there are endless interpretations of the uh, symbolism and so on at uh, at, at chatal sorry at uh, gobekli um and um as so i i was so wary of treading on people's toes i mean i know that um eleni for example has uh, written recently or written anyway about about um, about uh, an interpretation uh, I, I have just I, I mean I think it's probably very very difficult to to, to make sense of it I, I have two ideas one one is that um, why do you need that great menagerie of different types of animals and um, so I wonder whether that, that it may be in some way related to these uh, different segments whether the segmentation you know was in some way, symbolized by these different animals and so on and so forth. Uh, but I don't know if there's any real evidence of, of that. The, the, the other idea that I find very intriguing is again from uh, Clastra and um, from David Graeber, um, uh, which is that, um, that you, have the, you, you, you can have uh, these types of egalitarian systems which um, imagine power as, as violent and unpleasant as a warning against it. And so, you know, you have these pillars with these nasty animals with bare teeth and sort of, and, and we can see the, 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 um, the ribs and so on. I mean, it, these are a nasty, these, 
And, and I've written with Lynn Meskel on, 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 the, on the violence and imagery of, of that and at Chatter, that this sort of, the violence of it could be a, a, way, a way of, um, of uh, warning people about the danger of naked power and so on. So I mean, I, I don't know there's any way that, that one could sort of get closer to that. And, but I think it's a fasc fascinating, wonderful uh, idea. You, you, you asked about the, the misfits at Chatel. And what I'm referring to there is that, um, you know, most people are buried in houses at Chatel, but there are some cases where there are burials in open areas or midden. And um, there's at least one case um, in which um, the argument is made by the human remains team that the individual was someone who was ill-formed or misformed or disabled during life. He would, he would have been, he or she would have been very obviously uh, different. And, and so it's interesting that, that this person is found excluded in, in, in midden areas. So that's what I meant by this notion of, of, of uh, excluding or misfits. Um, the, the question about molecular through time is really great. And I, I need to think about that more and do more work on it. I, I have a sort of feeling that it, there might be a shift um, from sort of what one might call more community to more um, hmm, uh, more, yeah, from a from more sort of um, from sites where there is some sort of ritual focus somewhere to sites where the ritual focus just disappears, where there's no cemetery, or so, or no burial, and, and maybe a separate cemetery, and then sort of and a sort of process of specialization, perhaps, where you get special burial sites and so on. So I, I don't, I haven't thought it through. I don't really, I, I, I don't know if there's any real pattern, but I just wonder whether, whether within the molecular there are transformations, particularly basically, I suppose, from the sort of middle PPNB stuff into the pottery Neolithic stuff. Ganesh, you're um, muted. Uh, Joanna Clark, are you here? Uh, yes, hello. Yes, okay. I am. If you don't mind, I'll, my connection isn't very good, so I'll, I'll okay. keep my camera off. Do you, do you want to try to ask? I would. I was interested early on in your talk. Thank you very much, actually, um, for a really interesting talk. And I was interested very early on, you made a quick comment about um, an uptick in uh, sheep herding in the later phases. And I wondered if you could just elaborate on that a little bit more um, and whether you might, it, whether you think it could be linked to a much wider intensification of pastoral networks, for instance. Um, and I also wondered if you'd published anything on this or any of your team members. Thank you. Um, I think it's the case that um, the, the basic pattern of increased density of sheep uh, in deposits uh, after 6500, uh, I think it is published initially in um, one of the Chatel volumes. Um, uh, I think it would be volume, um, volume eight. Um, and, um, but we have a lot of more evidence now, and particularly from um, increased uh, coverage by Jessica Pearson of, of uh, the um, movement of animals. And, um, and so when I'm talking about an uptick, um, that this is based simply on the density of different types of bones. Um, so we, we, the percentage of bones that are domesticated sheep is very high. But, but, I, but I was more interested in that diagram in the actual density of bones, which shows this very major increase. And I think there are lots of changes going on, on happening on site, which are to do with the more intensive processing of, of sheep bones. So, you know, very careful breaking up and, and, um, and using and boiling and uh, processing very, very intensively uh, sheep bones. 
and that um, this is linked to a, a wider use of the landscape and we, we see in a number of ways the, the sheep are very rarely um, grazed off the plain itself so it's not the case that animals are being um, grazed very widely in the surrounding uh, upland areas um, but nevertheless on the plain itself there is a, a wider a wider use of the landscape and so and, and of course in the late in the late phase uh, we have a sort of sheep herding so sheep herding type site at Pinarbasha suggesting uh, you know again a sort of a, a shift to a, a much more specialized and um, man carefully managed system uh, which uh, is part of you know herding manuring lo lots of sheep dung on, on site um, lots of evidence of manuring and so on and then uh, uh, through this whole process increasing emphasis on cattle uh, and cattle management that, and, and then by the end we have something that looks fairly like domesticated cattle but it's the cattle just gradually gradually change decrease in size through time so a slow process so, so yes, I, I think um, more elaborate pastoral networks and things and, and intensification in those upper levels. Thank you very much. Any question? May I ask? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for this night. Uh, I want to uh, ask about Göbekli Tepe and domesticated. Uh, I wonder your uh, uh, I wonder your uh, personal uh, opinion. Uh, uh, we know this uh, at least. We know this uh, first layer of Göbekli Tepe. Uh, this uh, school cools. Cults, school cults, uh, they founded uh, three schools. Uh, after the agriculture or uh, domesticated animals started, uh, maybe uh, people uh, started to leave this uh, some rituals. I wonder it. Exactly uh, in the Chataloyuk, uh, uh, many evidence about uh, agriculture or uh, domesticated animals, but uh, it Göbekli Tepe, uh, at least we, we know these first three layers uh, don't found uh, any proof uh, about uh, agriculture or domesticated animals. Uh, maybe uh, I just uh, wonder your uh, personal opinion. Uh, maybe this Göbekli Tepe uh, just about this uh, sacrifice area. People don't want uh, this, don't have time this uh, agriculture or other things, but Chataloik people uh, start to, to uh, agriculture or uh, domesticate animals. Uh, maybe they for uh, bo uh, more effort for uh, other things. They not have time for uh, ritual or uh, other things. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I hesitate to talk about um, the, the uh, subsistence economy at uh, Gebekli, uh, and I, you know, I really look forward to um, sort of systematic results from there, particularly to do with the plant um, plant evidence. Um, but um, I, my, my my view is that Gebekli is is definitely a settlement site. I mean, in my view, there's no no doubt about that. That it has it has has these ceremonial structures within it. Uh, but um, the new evidence, uh, as far as I read it, seems to suggest that there are domestic houses associated with the enclosures right from the start. And 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 when I visited the site several times, I. I was completely convinced, given the enormous density of um, uh, of a normal domestic residues there, that that somehow or other this was domestic site, and um, so I've, I I I um I, I don't I don't accept that it was a, um, a, a some sort of ritual, just a ritual place in the landscape. I, 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 does that does that help to answer your question? Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. Anna, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. Much better than last week. Okay, uh, please. 
Thanks, Ian. It was really a pleasure, as always. Uh, I, I want to comment uh, about uh, this idea of uh, uh, the CISO between what you call molecular and uh, molar, in the sense that uh, it keeps repeating itself because, uh, you know, going back into my main domain of the Natufian, you can also see that um, at least at the beginning when we started to compare between the Natufian households and the PPNA household uh, at Native Agdud, we were uh, quite impressed by the move from uh, what we consider communal groundstone uh, facilities, you know, like huge motors or uh, rock motors uh, to the fact that uh, each, um, let's put, I don't know even how to call them, house or structure had its own uh, ground, ground stone utensils. You know, it, it looked as if uh, and if you envision it, and I permit myself, just like you were talking about these elders coming to decisions in Chatan, so it looked like while at the Natufian you had this, uh, you know, group of women or men going to use these huge um, uh, rock mortars or even the big ones that were brought over into the site and never moved if we couldn't move them from the outside. And then you go into the Neolithic and you can see that each family had its own uh, ground stone uh, mortar or, or more uh, truly uh, grinding stone. It's like, if you want to think about it, it's really moving it to from these larger uh, structures and the communal facilities into smaller structure and the individual uh, use of uh, facilities or uh, furniture. And what I believe also uh, what's happening is this process of uh, fusion and fusion. And I think that through time, uh, we are gaining the capacity to endure greater numbers without uh, the structure, the general structure breaking down. I mean, while we at the beginning, let's say that uh, we can't stand living in, uh, in a cluster that is more than 200 people and you have this fission then the next stage, the agglomeration, you can reach up to 1,000 people and then it breaks down. And once again, there is the fusion process and you have, let's say, I don't know, 6,000 people and then it breaks down. And I think that's, that's, the, that's the way I see it. I don't think it's linear. I think it comes and goes, the fusion fusion, but it happens on a larger scale each time. And uh, if you want me to be really fanciful and think about what happens, you know, much, much later, you can imagine what happened to the cities, you know, in, in the Western civilization in the 10th, 11th century AD. So I think it, it also goes pace in pace with economics becoming more and more complex. And uh, so, so I think it's not just going back and forth, it's going back and forth, but always in a higher magnitude. Mm, thank you, that's great. Um, I mean, I, 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 I try to say that I don't think that the molar molecular thing is, um, is a sort of category that you can say uh, that unequivocally that a particular site or period is one one or the other. I mean, yeah. in fact, I said, I said that you you know you could actually have um, both of them at the same time on a site. Yeah, yeah and, because and, it's individual. Yeah, and and also and also, I, but I very much like the going backwards and forth thing, Anna. I think that's really great. I mean, uh, 
uh, uh, Chattel, you know, I've talked about, um, I mean, we don't know really, really what happened right at the bottom of Chattel, but I mean, uh, you, certainly by the middle, you have this more molar thing, and then you have the more, more molecular thing. And then on the West Mound, you could argue that you're back to a sort of more molar thing. So you go backwards and forwards. And, and, uh, and I like that idea of a sort of a continual tension that, that is basically uh, about whether you want to be in a highly structured system or, in a, high, or a highly molecular uh, system. And so I, I, I like that very much, Anna. I think, I think the idea of, of um, different things happening in different places at different times and people are struggling with this sort of this problem. But I, I, I don't see it as the same as fusion and fission, I don't think, because it seems to me that it's possible to have a, a highly molar system which is more like what I understood Ian to be saying perhaps about an aggregation site. I can, I can conceive of an aggregation site which is highly molar, but is just a temporary aggregation site and everybody's actually wandering around. The, so it's not so that, uh, and, and similarly, the molecular can be highly structured and stable, like it's somewhere like Hatula, it's highly structured and stable, but, it, but it's based around these independent units. So I don't think it's the same as fission and fusion um, but I, but I absolutely, I think you're absolutely right that we need not not to think about it as an overall, um, you know, thing, an evolutionary thing, because the same thing is happening in the Bronze Age and you know, happening in the Paleolithic and so on. It's the same tension. But I nevertheless think that there's an interesting thing going on in the in the in in, in the area, um, uh, you know, in this period that that where you do get a, a shift from molar to molecular, um, which I think is very important in initiating things like the origins of agriculture and so on.